The following is an alternative history project revolving around the events of Operation Sea Lion. This was the Nazi contingency to invade the United Kingdom during the Second World War. In favour of his infamous bombing campaign, even Hitler disliked the idea. Despite this, a plan was formed for the possibility that the jackboot might march on British soil. Historical events have been changed in order to form a more believable scenario in which the invasion of the United Kingdom could take place. Sergeant Major Mark Cray stood at ease in front of the desk of Major Henry Jameson. Since the past few months of 1940, civilians had answered the call to arms. Jameson had been charged with the task of turning the remaining few into what he knew would become the remaining fewer civvy streetwalkers into soldiers. Jameson had seen action at the age of 18 as a lieutenant in France during the Great War. He was now approaching his 40th birthday. Cray, a firm 10 years older, had experienced the horror of the trenches of France in 1914 to 1917, having been wounded at the Battle of Cambrai when a sniper's bullet struck his hip. Cray had requested to see Jameson, as the numbers on his recruit register had not quite added up to what he had expected. He should have a hundred men, but had received just 62. The country is, as you know, experiencing difficulties, Sergeant Major. Some men may have been given different dates or places. The Germans are bombing our communications network every night, so we can expect confusion, Jameson said, scribbling on some requisition forms. That being said, the numbers we have received are unacceptable. Yes, sir. What do you suggest we do? Cray replied. Wait one day, Jameson said shortly. If they still fail to turn up within the time, we'll send for their local constabularies to find them. Yes, sir, Clay replied. An uneasy silence entered the room, save for the scratching of Jameson's pen. Sensing the lack of satisfaction in the sergeant major's voice, Jameson stopped writing and looked up. The two veterans made eye contact. That'll be all, Sergeant Major, he said. Cray stood to attention, saluted and made an about turn and marched out of Jameson's office. Sixty-two men. Barely enough for two platoons. Not that it mattered. The requisition form had been for rifles and ammunition. Of the sixty-two who had turned up, at this moment he could arm less than twenty, with a calculated forty rounds each. Suddenly, all the rifles left on the beaches of Dunkirk were being missed. Jameson checked his watch, 9am. About time the Luftwaffe usually turned up. No sooner had this thought crossed his mind, an air raid siren wailed in the distance. Southampton again, most likely, he reasoned. The Luftwaffe now controlled the air, daylight bombing serving almost as a gloat to remind the British of what they had lost and what they were soon to lose. The dull thud of bombs began, as did the bark and cascade of profanities from Cray outside on the parade square. Moving to his office window, Jameson sneaked a peek at the new recruits, still in civilian clothing, lined up in ranks of three. They were misshapen, some skinny, some round. They slouched and fidgeted, heads moving from side to side to see what the other was doing, backs bent. Regardless, 62 men was the hand they had been dealt. Already in his mind, Jameson tried to single out the ones who would make the best soldiers. Morbidly, he compared himself to a farmer picking his best cows for the slaughter. Castle Road was a steep uphill walk to Sally Brown's house from the centre of Wilton Village. Much fun to be had freewheeling down on a bicycle, or even more so on a snowy day on a sled. However, ascending through the wind and horizontal rain had even the most seasoned farmer groaning at the prospect. Carrying a basket of meat, eggs and milk, Sally bowed her head to keep the rain out of her eyes. She could feel the raindrops wrapping against her hat. Her cottage came into view, as Sally lifted her head, a gust of wind sent her hat flying into her hedge. Pulling her mousy brown hair off her face, Sally retrieved it, wrestling it away from the hedge. In the few seconds she had been hatless, the rain had taken advantage and made its way into her clothes. As a country girl born and bred, Sally was used to the elements, for ten years having been out in the fields tending sheep, cattle and pigs since the age of six. As she bent down to pick up her hat, a piece of white paper was taken by a gust of wind. Sally cursed and chased after it, finally catching up. It was soaked through. It was a photograph of a young man in uniform. Archie. They had known each other at school, he a couple years older. Sally had always been a quiet child. Even now she preferred her own company. In fact, she had been so quiet at school, the teachers had speculated she might be simple. Archie had come to her aid, saying, 
She's not simple. She's smart enough to know when to be quiet, unlike you. After that, they would become firm friends. On Archie's last day of school, he stole a bottle of gin and cigarettes from the teacher's desk. They shared an awkward first kiss, followed by vomit, most likely from the booze. A year later, Archie would take a one-way trip to Dunkirk. The photo had been taken the day he left. Had they been married? No. Engaged? No. Engaged to be engaged? No. In fact, other than the occasional walk, they did not resemble a couple. Sally had received one letter from him suggesting that they see a film together when he got back from France. This would never come to pass. Sally wanted the men to stop dying, so she had made up her mind to become an army nurse. The photo she kept to remind her why. Sally was only 16, too young to join. The village ran short classes from local doctors and nurses to spread a basic understanding of triage. The thought lingered in her head constantly about what would happen if the Wehrmacht came to England. Every hand would be needed. Sally opened the door to her house to find her mother in the kitchen, waiting over the kettle. She offered Sally a cup of tea. Sally accepted standing by the stove in her soaking wet clothes. She noticed a bottle of gin on the side with a freshly broken seal. Sally's father had left the family, consumed by whiskey-soaked nightmares of France. Sally's mother had decided to drown her demons too. Do you want a fag? Her mother asked, holding out a packet of cigarettes. You know I don't smoke, Mum, Sally replied. Someday you will, her mother said, striking a match to light her cigarette. Sally began to prepare the kettle for tea and sat down at the kitchen table where her mother was now sitting. The bombers will be coming over soon, her mother said. They don't even wait for darkness anymore. They use the quarry as a landmark. They don't waste their bombs on us. Besides, the weather's too bad, Sally said. If only the weather was always this bad in England, then maybe they'd leave us alone. You don't realise what you've got until you lose it, and then bombs start dropping out of the sky. Well, they don't bomb us, Mum. No, but soon they'll be kicking down our doors. And when they do, we'll be ready for them, just like Mr Churchill said, and he was a soldier. Well, we'll be ready, will we? What are you going to do? Show up with your sewing bag, stitch up all the boys, give them a kiss on the head, sing them a song and tuck them up for the night? Do you have a problem with me joining the nurses, Mum? Sally asked, putting her cup down. What do you think? Her mother replied, laying her cigarette down and getting up from the table, making a beeline for the gin bottle. I don't know. That's why I'm asking, Sally said with tight lips. Her mother took a gulp of gin straight from the bottle. Fritz likes them young, you know. They'll have you over the table in a mo- They won't come here, Mum, Sally raised her voice. They have to cross the channel full of mines and nets and they can't do it. Soon you'll be mothering half of Germany's kids, her mother said, appearing not to have heard. Sally said nothing. She'd had enough. She walked upstairs, shut her bedroom door and flopped onto her bed. Rudy Weber could feel himself swaying in the early morning sun. His mouth was dry head throbbing as the full effects of a hangover began to take hold. He was standing in the front rank of his platoon on the parade ground of a captured French barracks. Lieutenant Mayer marched up and down, inspecting care of Kit. Rudy could see Mayer out of the corner of his eye coming closer. Rudy began to feel a pot of queasiness start to simmer in the pit of his stomach. Mayer stood before Rudy, looking him up and down. Saliva began to form in Rudy's mouth. The pot was beginning to bubble. Good morning, Private Weber. How are you this morning? Mayor inquired. I'm fine, thank you, sir. And yourself? Rudy managed to croak. Mayor raised his eyebrows, leaning in. Say again? I'm fine, thank you, sir. And yourself? Rudy repeated. Before Mayor had a chance to respond, there was a heavy thud. On instinct, everyone turned to see a man lying face down on the ground. Mayer cursed under his breath and began to walk over to the fallen soldier. At this point, Rudy could not hold on. The contents of his stomach revealed itself. Coughing and choking, Rudy managed to glimpse Mayer tilting his head up to the sky as if in prayer. Performing an about turn, he walked back to Rudy, looking down at the vile puddle on the ground, and then back up at Rudy. Before he could form an apology, Mayer raised his hand to silence him. Appearing to think for a moment, Mayer leant in, his face inches away from Rudy's ear, before pointing to the man laying on the ground. If I were a betting man, I'd wager that that 
is Private Fisher, yes? Strong possibility, sir, Rudy replied, swallowing. Mayor nodded his head. Strong possibility. I'd say so, too. I would also go as far to say that you and he are probably somewhat responsible for each other's substandard state this morning. Yes, sir. I'm very sorry, sir. Rudy began to apologize again. Shut up! May I cut him off? You and he are close. Believe me, I know. But you are also soldiers. Soldiers in a foreign country full of people who hate us. Two drug soldiers are an easy target for anyone who may want revenge. Mayor was serious. He pointed back at Private Fisher, who was beginning to show signs of movement. Pick him up and report to me at 1800 hours. And don't fucking throw up on my parade ground again. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Don't say sorry. Just don't do it again. The rest of the day was absolute hell. After the inspections, Rudy helped his childhood friend Michael Fisher off the ground. They staggered to their feet, stumbling to their duties. Rudy and his company had been stationed in France since its occupation, enjoying many of its restaurants and general easy-ish lifestyle for the time being. Rudy was, to put it lightly, unqualified. Despite passing the fitness test and training, he had a pot belly and glasses, not something many of his comrades saw a soldier of the Third Reich to be. Day ended. The sun was going down when Rudy and Fisher reported to Lieutenant Mayor. Knocking on his office door, after being ordered in, they saluted. Sitting in a chair was a man in a black SS uniform. Private Fisher, Private Weber, this is Lieutenant Hitz. He is currently in charge of the Miltewaldung in this area. You will be in his charge. Lieutenant Hitz stood. He towered over them, blonde hair, blue eyes, chiseled jaw, in peak physical condition. How long do I have them for? He said bluntly. For the next four weekends, Mayor said. A flash of frustration crossed Hitz's face. Under whose orders? Sturmbaufjör Michels, Mayor said. Hitz remained stone-faced before nodding. Fine. Report to me all 700 Saturday and Sunday mornings. Don't be late. They were dismissed. No sooner had the door shut behind them, Fisher spoke. Holy shit, did you see who that was? He said, excited. Who? It was Lieutenant Josef Hitz. Am I supposed to know who that is? Rudy said, completely uninterested in Fisher's enthusiasm. How do you not know who he is? During the invasion, he and his platoon were cut off, surrounded on all sides. They held him off for a whole day and night. The man killed like a hundred men with his bare hands. He has not killed a hundred men with his bare hands, Rudy said. Even if he had, why would an SS officer be in charge of manning outposts? Because he was demoted, he disobeyed orders, and they wanted to make an example of him. You should buy him flowers and a box of chocolates to make him feel better. Saturday came around. Time for the punishment to begin. The remedial duty that was usually tasked to the Mitte Waltung inspecting papers, searching cars, and thrusting bayonets into hay carts. They were stationed at a small dirt track leading out into nowhere, a small hut and a wooden barrier serving as the only symbol of security. Hitz gave his orders in a steely tone before leaving them alone. Coffee? Fisher asked, indicating to a small stove with a boiling metal canteen upon it. Yes, thanks, Rudy replied, pulling his mug out of his pack. There was a kettle and a small stove the previous guards had left for them to keep running. This is not so bad, Fisher said, looking around. Nice and peaceful. We've only been here five minutes, Rudy said, checking the kettle. This'll be easy. Coffee and checking French girls' papers? How hard can it be? Since you can't read, I think it might be a challenge, Rudy said, sitting down. Rudy, my friend, you are too funny, Fisher said, leaning against the doorframe of the box. He pulled out a packet of cigarettes and ordered one to Rudy. Rudy refused. He didn't smoke unless after drinking a few beers. He found that coffee and tobacco made his heart palpitate, making him giddy. Fisher lit up and exhaled through his nose, something that he did for reasons only known to him. He was a chain smoker. For reasons being reasons, Fisher was rarely called by his Christian name amongst the other enlisted men, whereas Rudy almost always was. Not due to any different degrees of respect or military prowess, but socially... Michael was superior, having mastered the art of drinking until the early hours of the morning with no sleep, then being able to endure physical training, most likely while still drunk, with nothing but coffee and cigarettes as fuel. I hear we might be invading Russia, Fisher said, exhaling. Really? We don't seem to be moving anywhere, replied Rudy. (laughs) Two jokes in two seconds. I'm most impressed. I just heard talk we might be going there. 
Talk from who? Just people around, I don't know. Taking a drag of his cigarette. No one is stupid enough to invade Russia. It's nearly winter anyway, Rudy said, pouring coffee into their mugs. It's just what I heard. Again, from who? Rudy replied. This was often the way Fisher presented information. Vague and often inaccurate. Um, your mother told me, actually, he said back quickly. You're very funny, Rudy said as he handed Fisher his drink. It's true, she writes to me. To tell you to stop writing to her? No, that's what I write to her, Fisher said in a mocking tone of pity. She's a lonely woman. I was just trying to comfort her, but she wanted more from me. But as the good friend that I am, I had to decline. She's been married for 23 years, and as far as I know, she still is. Exactly. So she's bound to crave male attention. She's being neglected, Fisher said, showing no sign of stopping. If anyone is craving male attention, I imagine it's you. Is that why you drink so much, just to prepare for whatever you might have to swallow behind closed doors? Rudy fired back. No, I drink because I miss your mother, Fisher returned. And I drink because I miss your sister. I don't have a sister. When I fuck your mother, you might. The duel was a draw. Nothing of note for the rest of the day, with the exception of two rather attractive female women on bicycles holding papers for bar work. Fisher made sure to note down the name for future reference, most likely for personal reasons. Not likely they would let him anywhere near either of them anyway.